Hey, thank you a lot. It's good to be up here. I, I got to tell you, I have um, my sister and brother-in-law live about, you know, about two hours west of here in southern Steuben County. They actually farm borders in Potter County. So um, I'd like to say I understand a little bit what it's like to farm in the north, uh, northern PA anyway. Uh, but that, that being said, what I said in the, in the opening, I'm, I'm just going to tell you, a lot of the specifics you will have to figure out here. And just what I heard already, I'm encouraged about that. And so I'm going to blow through some, again, some, a few more concepts. And you know, I'm here to make you think and uh, to help you to be able to figure out how to do the practical stuff. Um, so uh, I, I guess I the debate whether to say is not. Today, I'm feeling fantastic, except my back is killing me. And I woke up yesterday morning, and I don't know why. So if you see me a little stiff-legged, don't worry about me. I'll be OK. I've got a chair here to keep it to sit down. So don't worry about me. But I'm saying I'm, I'm not if you're used to seeing me. I usually walk around every day. I'm not doing that today. Um, so, so I'll just get that out of the way. Cover cropping, simple concept. You know, we all probably uh, agree that it's a, it certainly is a good thing to do. I'm trying to get my thing to work here, Ray. I'm not sure it was working. I'm um, hitting it, hitting it. There. Maybe you take, maybe how to wake it up. So it's a simple concept. Okay, sorry about that. But I'll just move ahead here and say that it's uh, very complex to be successful. And partly that's why we are here today, to figure out what that complexity is. And to realize it is only a tool, it's more about how we do our management. You're going to hear me say management quite a bit today, because that is the secret, one of the secrets to success. So I got this video sent to me about a year ago. And it was in an email, and it was two sentences. Uh, this is how we're farming. I think we need cover crops. Where should we start? <laughs> what would you say? So would you trade your northern Pennsylvania climate for this? I don't know. Uh, but uh, it was a sincere question. And I'm, I'm thinking, wow, that's, that looks like a desert. You know, is there, is there any soils there at all? Well, there must be because they're spending a lot of horsepower to try to rip it up to grow something there. But no matter where we're at, this happens to be South Africa, no matter where we're at, we have challenges. And that's my point. You have challenges. I get that. I understand that. Um, so I'm going to be going down there in September to try to help these guys. Now, I've since seen pictures that look pretty impressive. Okay. So it's not all like this. But anyway. So. Complexity is, is something that we tend not to do, and it's mainly because we don't know how to do it. If you guys would move to Louisiana and be sugarcane farmers, imagine how complex that would be. If a Louisiana farmer would move to northern PA, it would be very complex for him to raise corn and soybeans in this climate. And that is the same way you're going to have to think about cover crops. Most of us don't have a lot of experience in this whole soil health thing. So, you know, it, it, it is somewhat tough. It's somewhat hard sometimes to sell complexity when everybody wants simplicity. It's human nature. But um, I want to think, to have us think about maybe a little different way we look at our soil. How can you grow your soil? And I say that because soil is life. There's life in the soil. How can we grow that life? How can we take that to the It's there. God put it there. We need to better manage it. We've forgotten in agriculture the last five decades or more about the life of the soil. We have become applicators. We've lost the art of farming. We like to buy things in a bottle or a bag and run big tractors because it makes us feel good. Okay? And that's all fine. And like Ray said, I'm not here saying no to fertilizer. I'm not saying no to pesticides. I'm not, I'm, gonna, I'm a no-till farmer, but you know, I'm, I'm just I'm not saying no to everything. It's about now let's bring biology into this. So 
we think about our soils, and most of the soils around here probably would have been woods. All of them would have been. Pennsylvania, Penn's Woods, that's what it's named after. They were formed by multiple species that had living roots in all year round. So you're going to hear this, farming in nature's image, mimicking nature. You're going to hear this multiple times, but it's what I want you to think about when you're thinking about your farm. How can you inch toward that? How can you inch toward that? See, we don't, society, and nobody in here is going to want to just go out and get their food by foraging for berries and nuts. There may be a few people who like to do that once in a while, but that's not going to happen, at least anytime soon. So how let's back up from there. How close can we go to that with what we understand today? But, you know, most of us feel like this. I can't risk a financial loss or I may lose the farm. Very valid question. All this is great, but I still have to make a living. That's why we're suggesting you do this stuff as you're comfortable, as you learn, according to your level of figuring it out, talking to people, and, and so forth. So uh, one of the rules of thumb that I think is very helpful in you understanding this is to treat your cover crops like you treat your cash crops. You put a lot of effort into getting ready to plant corn the first day it's ready. You want to make sure your planter is ready to go. You would not be a successful farmer if your corn planter is not ready to go when it's corn plant time. And some of you maybe already have them ready to go now. You'll be working along the first warmer days coming up here soon. Um, and you probably, most of you have your seed corn already bought, right? Most of you probably do. That's what we do. But are you thinking about your cover crops for this coming year? And I'm not saying you have to buy your cover crop seeds today, uh, but if you are thinking about it, talk talk to the seed guy. The seed, we have King's Agri Seed representative. I don't know, is there any other cover crop companies here? I don't want to leave anybody out. But talk to them. If, so you can be thinking about what you want to do. What if we have a hot, dry summer? And, and, and things get mature sooner, then you may have two weeks more opportunity. Are you ready to seize that opportunity? Cover crops, success is about being an opportunity. Last year it was late. Couldn't do a lot of cover crops. Well, now we're thinking, I'm going to talk about this, what if we could interseed some, or corn, or soybeans, so that we can cover that lack of ability to get something in the ground in the fall. On some of our acres. Cover cropping is not black and white. It's not like you are totally in or you're totally out. No, it's about being an opportunist. So you need to think where you're at, what you can do. Here's another thing you don't hear many people talking about. Who is your mentor? Who's the neighboring farmer who's maybe a step or two ahead of you that you can talk to? Um, I don't know if you're having these little meetings in, in your area. Down our way, we have these cover crop cafes or cover crop town halls. Um, we're just get together. Sometimes it's just three or four farmers in their machine shed for an hour or two in the morning and just chatting. Uh, if there could be someone to organize some of that, you, that's how you learn. What work? What's your planter look like? What do you have in your planter to get through a living cover crop? Practical things. So I'm suggesting you do that. Who is your mentor? Who do you follow? And it, it, sometimes it can be national people who are in the news, and you can Google a lot of stuff, and YouTube a lot of stuff. There's tons of information out there. But all that, as you know, got to be filtered through Northern PA with its limitations and its opportunities, I might add. Um, I've talked to, this, this is a little eye-opening to me, met a farmer from Florida once. Guess what he said? I don't have any time for cover crops. I'm like, really? Yeah, he said, I trip a crop. I grow three cash crops in the season. Where am I going to put cover crops in? Well, hey, if that's three different crops, that's better than monoculture. But then I said, do you, so you, have, do you have any four week window of opportunity? And he said, well, as a matter of fact, I do. I said, well, you can plant sun now and sort of sedan. Four weeks is enough over the summer. In Florida, it's summer half year anyway. He's like, oh, okay. So that was just, that was where he, he thought he couldn't plant cover crops because he didn't have time. And you all say the same thing too. And it's a, it's a valid statement. But now we have to rearrange the picture. 
Cover cropping is not so much about finding the missing puzzle piece. The only example is if you're growing small grain. Any small grain growers here? Few. If you're growing small grains, pretty easy after they come off and, and probably mid to, to late July up here, get a cover crop planted. There's no excuse not to. That's like finding a missing puzzle piece there. But as far as in the corn, soybean, alfalfa, hay, rotation, you're going to have to rearrange the picture a little. Probably. To make it work. You're going to have to think differently. You have to take a step back. How can I incorporate this? So this is my friend, Frederick Thomas from France. Um, we, I've been over there numerous times, and we hit it off really good. So you can educate a person, but you can't make them think. I'm educating you today. But until we, at lunchtime, we have a chat, then I can, then I can, then we can have a dialogue where we make each other think. Follow what I'm saying? That's why, I'm, that's why I'm pushing this mentoring thing. Yes, there's. I, I had one guy who told me everything he learned about cover crops he learned on YouTube. Okay, that's legit. It happens. That's legit. There's a lot of stuff out there now. Um, but I would encourage you to talk to farmers in your local area. Okay, a little bit of my history, where I'm coming from, from Southern Lancaster County. Uh, my organic matter has gone from 2% up to actually 5.5. I guess my PowerPoint doesn't like your math. Don't know there, Ray, but whatever. It should say 5.5, okay? You can see the bar is bigger. That's over 30 years of management. Management. That's what caused that. Primarily, no tillage, primarily cover crops. And that has intensified recently. Now, if you see where I was, Back in 1982, seven species total on my farm. And uh, you may say, well, that's a lot. Well, that included my cover crops and everything. Uh, 2017, 27 species. That includes my cash crops and my cover crop. I've diversified. The title of my talk is here is talking about diversification. And that's what I want to start to hone in here. Diversification. And this is where I have, I have my story, my journey of diversifying. And uh, I do want to back up a little bit, just to just bring you up to speed from where I'm at. I'm a I'm, um, third generation farmer. My son's 21. He's, he's all in, which helps allow me to travel a little bit more now and also allows him to manage the farm without that. I was in France for 10 days last September, and I came, I came back and, well, Dad, I understand why you have gray hair now. <laughs> it's good for him to have to make decisions when I wasn't around. So, anyway, I always wanted to be a farmer. Never, never didn't want to. I, I just from when I was when I was young. But really, what got me into this whole soil health thing, uh, if I, you know, using that term, was back in 1982. I didn't think soil erosion. Um, I hated to, to have take the time to close up ditches sometimes before harvest. And I just didn't think it was right. There's something within me. I just didn't think that was right. There was no talk about the Chesapeake Bay. There was no talk about soil health. Not back then. We never heard the term soil health. I did it because I didn't like the extra work. Plus, I just had this nagging feeling. This is not right, losing that good soil. This picture here was later on. Uh, was my son standing there when he was younger in the neighbor's field. And that's like a 10% slope just to give you a perspective there. My neighbor, who still conventionally still zero cover crops, he's 72 years old. To this day, he's never planned to cover crop, and he always tills. He's not going to change. He told me that. But his son has told me. He's basically kept his, his son out of it, which tells a little bit about it. But his son said, as soon as I can have to manage that farm, Steve, I, I need to talk to him. I want to learn how to do what you do. I see what you're doing. So it wasn't long until I did what now is called planting green, in this case planting green into uh, cereal rye, that's something I, I've done all the time now. I started doing research back in 95 because I, that was the first year I started doing public speaking. And Dr. Ray Weil was, the, was also a speaker of the program, he's in the audience. I asked the question, and you're going to think this is ironic. I asked the question, if we're in the no-till for a while, I, I said, I don't know if cover crops pay. Do cover crops pay? I, I actually thought they didn't. That, that's what I thought. He came up to me later and said, hey, you want to try that out? Let's do some research. We started what turned out to be 12 years of research. First four years, yields are fairly similar. And you can see how the plots are laid out up there. And the fourth year, 1999, was a dry year. 
28 bushels more corn where I had three years history of cover crops. Ever since that, the issue settled for me. Cover crops pay. Not every year. But even the year where they don't pay according to the ledger book, I'm invested. It's like the stock market. If you do dollar cost averaging, invest in the stock market every month or something, usually that's a good way. In some years, some months, you don't make any, you make lose money. But at the end, you're going to gain money. Cover cropping needs to be looked at in a 10 to 15 year, 20 year perspective. You have to have that mindset. So that was along the same time where I developed uh, rolling, uh, rolling crimson cover crops. And um, as far as I know, that's the first commercially built cover crop roller in the U.S. I got the idea from the Brazilians. Uh, they started it back in the 80s. And, uh, and then uh, probably a lot of you heard of the Tilly Dratties 2001. Dr. Wild brought that to my farm as part of a study and got, um, that's actually the first field, what later became the Tilly Dratties. And because there was no, none out in production, I saw to it to start getting them produced. And uh, while wow, helped me through that, we developed the variety. And that was then we launched, I launched what turned out to be the first cover crop seed company, to my knowledge, again, in the nation. And, and that was really, a, a, a few the 2000s, that was just cover crops were really starting to catch interest in, and everything. And, and boy, you know, I was kind of the forefront, the poster child of the radish. I was, and people still today called me, oh, you're the radish guy. You're the cover crop guy or whatever. And um, so, yeah, it was, it was, I got to be honest, it was a really, really good time. But big business caught up to me and brought on some partners to help me out. And I'm a farmer, never really was in big business before. I'm intrigued by it. I basically got some people to run my company and found out that it wasn't in my best interest. And long story short, things went down here really, really quick. I was within 18 hours of my farm being sold at a sheriff's sale. Can you believe that? I couldn't believe it either. I mean, it came up very quick. What happened? Chain of events. I was naive to get to that point. Learned a lot but was able then to get a plan worked out with another bank. So, today I'm paying monthly mortgage payments on my farm again. It's unfortunate, but I'm ready to move on. Uh, learn valuable lessons through that. So I'm back now, established cover crop coaching, and that's what I'm doing here today. I, I travel around teaching. I also have a group called Cover Crop Innovators where I do a weekly webinar that you pay to join. I have brochures up front in the back there if you're interested in that. So that's just, you know, we all go through hard times and tough times. And, and I, I just tell you, it, it was really, um, I guess you would say gratifying that the cover crop community really came around me, rallied around me because they, they understood it wasn't really my fault. And, and, it, and I, I say that, that, that the cover crop community, there is a unique bond there. And you know, Ray, you agree. I mean, you know, we, it's just, there's something about, and I think it's because we get up here, Ray's an awesome speaker, and you hear, and, and you don't know what we do in our private lives, but I'm just telling you, it is a passion, a true passion. And um, so I'm just saying there's this, and I think it comes down, we're doing the right thing. Okay, there's something to there that I think, that I think is valuable. So my goal on my farm is to have cover crops, to have, a, I'll say it this way, to have a living root in my soil all year round and to have my soil covered. I don't want to see my soil very often. Now I understand colder climates, opening it up, have the row warm up, and uh, you know, to get things going in the spring. I get that. Um, I have a set of root cleaners in my planter. If it's on the earlier side, I need to be a little more aggressive, I'll clean the row up a little bit, but a lot of times I'm not using them very much. So one of the things that happened last year is because of my financial situation, I could not get a line of credit. And I, I just thought, you know what, I'm going to try to put some of these things to the test. So I reduced my herbicides, I reduced my fertilizer. It was a good year last year, i got to tell you. But I took these numbers right off my Schedule F of my total payments of what I made for chemicals, fertilizers, and I reduced them dramatically last year. 
and it gave me some more confidence. And I've done thousands of tests on my farm, I've had a lot of things to go on, a lot of information on my fields. So I didn't just do this blindly, but I was, again, surprised a little bit of what I saw. Some of those tests, I want to run through one or a couple of them here to show you, and I want to um, encourage you to do whatever you can on your own farm to test things. This is back in 2010. I was looking at using legume cover crops. In this case, it was planted after wheat harvest. So plenty of time to plant my legumes and to test different combinations of legumes, legumes to see how they affected uh, my yield and the cost and everything in that. What was interesting, this year was a fairly normal spring, terminated legumes. I had a control with no cover crop and we got dry in June that year. And in those, there you can see going up through that uh, middle of that picture there diagonally is corn starting to curl. It was in June. It was dry. The reason being, the soil wasn't covered. It was a lot warmer, 100 degrees at 2 inches. And where the cover was, was 88 degrees. That's helping my corn grow. There's more moisture kept there. This is when the cover crop's really helping me out, really working for me. We got dry, uh, again, it was a drier year, and even in July, Dr. Wallace stopped in one day and he's looking at the plots, and, and there you can see, no cover crop. Uh, to be fair, I added 75 pounds of nitrogen with the planter when I planted the control plot, because I knew that my legumes were giving a certain amount of nitrogen. I'm a farmer, farmer first, researcher second. So I'm going, to try to, I'm going to try to do this research based on best farming practices for all treatments. Follow what I'm saying? I'm not trying to prove anything other than what can I do as a farmer to manage my inputs. That's what I'm trying to decide. I'm trying to make management decisions here. And what I found with the zero nitrogen applied on the cover crops, and you can see there, it's a little hard to see I know, but the lowest bar, the shortest bar, that's my control where there's no cover crop. And that actually had 75 pounds of nitrogen. None of the other plots did. So I got a nice cover crop effect there. We'll just call it a cover crop effect. It was keeping the soil covered, providing a little bit of nitrogen, keeping the soil cooler, all these things, the cover crop effect. Where I added 120 pounds of nitrogen in side dress, like B4, um, all the bars went up, as you would expect, added some more nitrogen. But even then, my control plot was lagging. Because maybe there would be a reason for you to grow more small greens. I know people who are starting now to switch to sorghum sedan instead of corn and make two cuttings. That opens up opportunities during the, during the summer to do other things. Especially on your shallier land or drier knolls and stuff like that. There's a little bit of ideas here and there where you can do that. So if you looked at all these plots, put them together, my cover crops gave me 32 bushels on a dry year. Notice those yields are pretty low for me. Now I'm not the best spot in Lancaster County. You hear about Lancaster County yields. I'm going to show you one later. <laughs> That's not me. I'm in the River Hills. Okay, so I, I'm more like you guys up here in, in, in a sense for hills and so forth. And these live seed coming in here. Uh, another test I did on a good year, again, full disclosure. This would have been after wheat harvest. And I'll just quickly tell you the, the, uh, the red bars are control, no cover. And then we had zero, half, and full rates of nitrogen. And there's the yield results down the bottom. On a good year, we still got some yield benefits by using the cover crop. But even though there's benefits aren't as much there, they're adding to my account. So that when I do get a, a challenging year, Remember my topic here? Adversity with diversity. So that's why I'm showing these here, to show you some of the contrast. You're going to see more benefits from what you invested in your soil when either it's probably too wet or probably too dry. On an ideal year, you won't notice those benefits as much. But you've still done something that year. That's the important message I want you to know that later on when that adversity comes, you'll be better prepared for it. Make sense? Okay. So why do you think, why don't you see disease and insect problems in woods, typically? Now, I'm from Pennsylvania. I've seen, I've seen gypsy moths come in and pretty much devastate a woods already. Okay? That's, that can happen in small 
But by and large, when you go to the woods, do you see blight? Do you see phytophthora? Do you see all the diseases we fight? Rarely. Rarely do you see insect problems that just devastate every year. Why? Why don't you see those problems in the woods? Anyone want to tell me? It's right up there. Diversity and living plants year round. All I'm saying is, okay, we understand that principle. How can we grow our food as close as, how can we mimic nature? Now for some of us, we're way over here, wherever that is. And we're different parts. I mean, I'm not accusing anybody here today. I'm just challenging you. What can you do on your farm to mimic nature a little more? That's my message today. And I'll guarantee you, it's diversity and more living roots. That's your answer. How can you have living roots more, and how can you diversify more? You do those two things, and everything else is pretty much full in place. Is that right, Ray? He likes that. That's good. I like to make Ray happy. You want to keep? I'm traveling with him. I gotta wake him up in the morning, or not quite. But that's what he's back for, for God. No. Um, okay. So, um, yes, sir. In your planting in the green, what do you see as far as your herbicide program? I'm gonna cover that a little later, but I've been able to reduce my herbicides. We leave it that for right now. Yes, I, I am, I'll just tell you to tease you. My goal is to eliminate residual herbicides and just go with post emergence where needed. Is that a good enough teaser? Okay. Um, where does this lead us to? I'm going to push you a little here. How many of you heard the term nutrient density associated with food? I think that's where the future is going. I don't care if you're a dairy farmer, if you're just a cash grain farmer growing soybeans and corn for pigs. At the end, that food eventually ends up in something that we as humans consume. If it's bacon, beef, whatever. Nutrient density is, I think, the future. That's where I'm headed. I've been working on this for years, and now I think it's time to get serious about it. This is a butternut squash. I just got these results back two weeks ago. And right now, the, the interesting thing is in nutrient density, to my knowledge, there's no standards out there. I don't know what the ideal butternut squash should be. Nobody knows. What they have done, the USDA, and you can look at up on the web, on the, on the internet. USDA has established a baseline, which is simply a measurement of the average that's on the shooting mark shelves right now. That's the baseline. Well, well that's, that's good. We can work with that. Um, so that's what my number's up here. I'm showing higher numbers. And there's not much I've done on that. I've been paying attention to my micronutrients lately. That is a result there, I feel, of diversity in living plants, where you can start to see this occurring. And obviously, I'm a farmer. I hope I can get paid for that. You would think I should. The reason we haven't done this is we haven't gotten paid. We just get paid for yield. Yield, yield, yield. And that's unfortunate because quality is junk. A lot of quality is junk. And, and, and that's part, and I'll just go on a little tangent, that's partly why we have our health care issues too. You want to solve a health care problem or at least not solve it? You want to help the health care problem, let's eat better food. And so that's where I think, with, and I'm going to show you this afternoon a little bit more how the reality of that is coming, in, coming to being. So we want to manage in nature's image. You've heard that being said. That's, that's what I want you to leave with, you know, this, this meeting here. How can you manage better than that? So interceding was brought up. Let's talk some practical things. Uh, pretty much, um, it's something that Penn State started about six years ago now. I've got to give them credit for having the idea. And uh, there's all kinds of units being out there now. This is a unit that Jim Hersey from Lancaster County developed. And, actually went up to New York State and he's done several thousand acres over the last couple of years with that unit. We have some other really, really cool apparatus out there that they're actually side dressing nitrogen, injecting, actually putting nitrogen in the ground side dress and, blow, and blowing on cover crop seeds at the same time. So now we're not making an extra trip. So um, I think I heard you guys get in this area of an applicator uh, to be able to do 
maybe not side dose nitrogen, but, but there's, there's equipment becoming available now to help do what I'm talking about. Uh, that, most of us probably <coughs> won't be able to afford a quarter million dollars or more, whatever that costs, but uh, you can go cheaper, at least to start out, test it. This guy actually sent me the picture, he said he was interceding with this, a little battery operated, little spinner, driving his motorcycle down the road. Uh, so that's an idea. There's all kinds of ways. People send me the picture of their modified drills that they're doing. I will tell you, it's pretty clear that you want to get the seed in the ground if you can. Broadcasting can work. I was talking to an organic grower earlier. They're doing glass cultivation, they're doing this. And even he said sometimes it doesn't work as good. Um, but um, this area in north, up into Quebec, Ontario, thousands and thousands of acres. And I'm not exaggerating. I think about 20, 25,000 acres now was done last year. So it's starting to uh, become reasonable and more profitable to do this. This is, a, this is actually a, I believe, like a 4,000 acre dairy farm in New York. Um, over in New York area, west of the Pink Lakes. I mean, look at that. That's silage uh, coming off. That's, that's just like, that is totally the best field I've ever seen. And that, you know, when you can do that, that, that really gets you excited. So as I said, there's different implements, there's different companies now actually making these. Uh, but a lot of times farmers are ingenious and they have toolbars around. There are all kinds of things I've seen that people are doing. One of the things they like is they get a bigger cover crop so they can hold manure in the fall. You ask back here somewhere about compaction. You have a nice cover crop growing like that, that's going to really help you. And here, talking about compaction, they're drag lining. I know that's not practical everywhere, but here, where it is, it's an idea. You're not hauling heavy equipment out there. This is beautiful. I mean, this is really ideal if you have manure to spread. You're putting on a living crop. That available nitrate, nitrogen, and manure is almost going to be taken up instantly and saved in the next year. So just from an environmental and economic, your pocketbook is a good way to go. However, it doesn't work everywhere. And we're still trying to figure out that this was a field in New York, one of the few that failed. And I got pretty much experience in this, and after all the normal questions, herbicide, histories, and all this, there wasn't a correlation. You know what's interesting? This field was a quarter of a mile from that beautiful field. And we couldn't figure out the difference. We, we, did, we never figured out the difference. Um, so, there's still, I would say, a lot of work to do, but I will tell you that it is working well enough. And here, the hot spot right now is Iowa and Minnesota. They're, they're getting rigs out there. They were on the last year. It worked out pretty good. So, you know, there's, there's times where we, we can get that to, to working better. One of the key things you need to think about is your residual herbicides. Because you're trying to, uh, you, you get your cover crop planted and get it growing, um, you know, in the spring, and that can be a challenge. Um, I guess I went one too far there. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that. The most easiest chemical to use as a residual is Verdict, a combination of Outlook and, um, what is it? Starts with this. Outlook and, uh, come on, Sharpen, thank you. They have very little residual in that. But I don't know if you use that here or if you like that. Go on the internet. Google Penn State Interceder Herbicides. They have a beautiful, well, fully written out uh, thing on herbicides. So I'm not going to go in that. There's so many out there. Um, the limitations are higher yielding corn. Does anyone know what the key limitation of the cause of failures in interceding? What would you guess? Pardon me? Well, he said mental, but I'm gonna, I am talking about something specific here. <coughs> it's shady. That is the reason. Because a lot of areas, most of the time it grows, uh, but, and, and, and then it dies out sometime. But everywhere the corners ran down or it's thin, it's always growing there. It's a sunlight issue. So there's several different things. Mike, my, my, since I don't have a lot of time to explain everything, try this on your worst fields. That's my biggest advice, try it on your worst field. They need your cover crops most anyway, because you'll tend to have lower yields um, and more sunlight will get in there. So that's the most practical thing I can give you. Different people are testing uh, flex, flex shear hybrids at a little lower plant population, uh, vertical leaves versus floppy leaves, or more upright leaves versus floppy, just to get more sunlight down. One of the reasons we think it's working further north, because it's worked, I've seen it work at 220 bushel corn the grain has worked. 
One of the reasons we think is there's just cumulative more sunlight up here. You guys probably get 15, 20 more minutes a day than I do in the summer. I figured this out. Uh, and I think that helps, just the ambient sunlight to get through there. So that's one reason why the further north, I think, it's a sunlight issue. So there's different ways we're looking at it. Do your worst fields. Um, and and that's, that's where I would suggest you start. And, and you know, keep playing around with it. Um, uh, we're far enough north here that I think, you know, you might find some places that will work. So um, maybe just do your end rows. A lot of times your end rows need cover crops the most because you have more turning and everything. And a lot of times they've been ran down by other operations. And just do your end rows. That's an, that's an option uh, right there. Um, so the most popular species are annual ryegrass, radish, crimson clover, hairy vetch sometimes, uh, red clover. Uh, red clover doesn't grow quite as good as uh, crimson clover in the spring. Um, cereal rye, triticale, as mentioned here. Sometimes farther south that hasn't worked because it just doesn't like the heat over the summer. But I would encourage you to mess around with this. Um, these are the top ones we know now. There's some other medics and some other pure clovers and other things. I'm just saying that, but I don't, I just know that ideas people have right now. And uh, one of them is orchard grass. Guess what? Guess why orchard grass was made? To grow in orchards, shade it. But orchard grass has struggles because it doesn't have a deep root system. And when we get dry in the summer, it just it loses out. If we get dry in the summer. If you can get orchard grass to kill, it's really going to do good for the top part of your soil type. It's not hard to kill. Orchard grass is a good survivor, but it's not, it doesn't have the best rooting system. So that's just some of the pros and cons. People ask, well, how much corn am I going to lose? All the research, I hear this all the time. I just saw an article come out yesterday from Ontario. Interseeding in corn does not take away yield. For whatever reason, it does not. And I can tell you, yes, there are some checks or some times where it has, but overall, it does not take away yield. So you don't need to, I'm just going to say, you probably don't need to worry about that. You're not going to sacrifice yield. Um, and this is just some pretty real data to have up there. So, no yield loss, uh, cover crop planting does not interfere with harvest. Now, I was glad the guy before me here mentioned about doing it in the soybeans, and I'm going to spend a little time. I, I, I didn't have pictures here to show you of soybeans. But you're far enough north that you can do this. And as I understand, correct me if I'm wrong, you NSCS guys here, isn't that what you're planning to do with your high clearance? Thing drive through soybeans right before leaf. And I would say when you see the first leaf on yellow, it's time to roll. Don't wait, because what if you do get a thunderstorm, you have to stay out a day or three, and then leaves can turn really quickly sometimes. So it's better to be a little early, I think. Once once the leaves start falling, you've lost opportunity. So the thing about it is though, the worst case scenario, you've got to understand risk here. We're farmers, we understand risk. So let's try to mitigate that. The worst thing that could happen is if you get into a wet fall and those leaves fall off and that cover crop starts growing and you can't harvest your beans and that cover crop is just growing gangbusters. Now I'll just say, if you're doing this, the first day those beans are fit, harvest them. So that's, that's my one um, advice. Make sure you get that. Second of all, it's amazing how much green you can run through the combine. I heard guys running six inches for, for the, it's just, it's so, so fluffy and almost like lettuce. You can run it through. Now, if any of you, probably none of you are, any of you are using food grade beans, it'll stain them. I've heard people got rejected doing this because food grade beans are staining. And I hear some people say, no, it doesn't stain them. Other said it does. That usually is not a problem with the use of beans here. Just a little bit of things you need to know. Get in there, get them off the first day they're fit. And then hopefully have a nice green <coughs> carpet growing up. Yeah. Have you ever heard of using oats and seeding earlier in soybeans so that they're actually mature and dry in the actually? Oh, so the, the oats are actually mature and, and like straw when you cut on the soybeans? I've never heard of that. Um, I mean, my concern would be in August you're taking moisture away from your beans. I tell you what, though, you brought up a good point that there's becoming more and more interest. I'm going to show you this afternoon companion cropping. Because sometimes, um, and actually you could physically separate the oats from the beans. 
And if you're doing that, now we can afford to take a yield hit on the beans because we're getting oats. So uh, just to, to you're, you're getting on some of the cut, that's the bleeding edge. We're talking cutting edge, that's the bleeding edge of cover cropping is, is companion cropping. So I've not personally done that. I'm doing some other things in that that I'll show you. So have you done it? Uh, you know people have done it? No, but we thought of that. No, we did it. And the oats will blow out the combine. Okay, so you, okay, okay. So you're saying the oats will blow out the combine. Well, I'm just, okay, if you wouldn't have, if they're not hard to separate, Maybe you want to think of that if you have someone that has a seed cleaner that can do it. Or you're, if you're just blowing the oats out of the combine, I'm afraid there you may lose an opportunity and, and losing your bean yield. Are you guys together? Or are you okay. Uh, okay? I'm just saying that's a great concept. Fine tune it. Let us know how it works. I applaud you for doing it. Um, so, anyway. Okay, what do you see up here is, I just found out about this last week, Cornell, to your north here, came out with this risk asset assessment calculator. Type in your zip code, and then right now we only have four cover crop species to choose from. Let's just say cereal rye, and type, or, or go with your mouse across you, and the, the date will show up on the calendar. And what it shows there is on the uh, black line is the last 15 years of weather data. The gray lines the last 50 years of weather data. So you can put it on a specific date. Let's just choose October the 18th for sure to rye. And it'll give you a percentage of the viability of doing that on that date. People ask me all the time, how late can I plant cover crops? My answer, you tell me the weather for the next six weeks and I'll give you a decent estimate. Well, it all depends on the weather. Obviously there's sometimes the time runs out. I would say you get rye planted at any time. <coughs> You can get the ground Thanksgiving, even up here, it'll hold in the soil and start growing here in the next couple of days, weeks, whatever. And it might be worth it. I'm not saying you use a whole farm like that. I'm just saying that's what I do. That's what the, the veteran cover croppers, they just keep planting to the done. And sometimes we're planting through frozen ground. When it's smeary, there's days that could be smeary. We even heard guys doing that in the spring. Or when the ground is frozen enough that you can keep the, the, from being smeary. That's a Pennsylvania Dutch word, if you don't know what that means. That means muddy. You guys know what smeary means. Yeah, so, uh, but you want to watch out for your wet spots. You might sink the tractor like Ray showed you a picture earlier here. Uh, okay, you get it? Uh, so this is the calculator. It's, uh, you can see just you can those words up there you can find. I just think it's cool. It's a cool tool. And there's all kinds of cal cover crop calculators out there now that you can use. And it really is helpful. We're getting more and more tools available to help manage our cover crop better. So where are you headed? <coughs> if you're just asking the question, I'm not planting cover crops because I can't pencil them out, you're asking the wrong question. We're here today, we have this meeting that's pretty much centered around cover crops. There's a reason for that, because it's working. And it's not, I mean, you, I could rhetorically say there's either a lot of us that are really stupid or we're on the sun. I cannot tell you dollars and cents the value of what my cover crops do, but in all honesty, you couldn't pay me not to grow because I've seen the benefits. That's where I'm at. You can't pay me not to grow cover crops. Now, there's all different kinds of ways to, to be more realistic about it, but you need to know what you're doing just like you do with your corn and your beans and your hay. You guys know what you're doing. You've been doing it forever. Cover crops are relatively new, so you got to learn. We got to go to kindergarten, work our work our way up through and try things. So um, generally, though, cover crops make a good farmer better and a bad farmer worse. And I say that it comes down to management. That doesn't mean if you make a mistake, you're a bad farmer. Okay, get that? You got to be trying things. Um, but but you learn from those mistakes. Every mistake I've ever made. I've learned something. I've learned something. It might be as simple as never do that again. <laughs> but you have to try. Uh, or it could be, oh, I should try that again, but do it differently. It could be. I don't know. So let's maximize the potential. Yeah, think about the potential you guys have. You heard this guy saying about putting out uh, rye in the spring. Or uh, I would say maybe you want to do oats too. I'm not sure if there's a difference between. Like preferring goats or rye. What we found out 
is that um, slugs actually prefer brassica types like pussy, rape, things like that that do germinate early. Some people are actually planting, if you can, in your plant, you're sprinkling oil seed rape right in the row, like you use your insecticide boxes, we still have one. There's some that don't, but uh, that or what I'm going to try, and I've had slug pressure. Uh, I've never had slug problems that have been insurmountable when I followed the rules, meaning rotation and planting green. Planting green does seem to help. There's enough farmers have done it. When you plant green, the slugs stay in the cereal rye. We want to use glyphosate to have a slower kill, and if, the, if there's moist enough ground there, we will wait till right before the corn comes up. Now, I don't use uh, GMO corn. Those of you who still do, if you have Roundup Ready corn and it's still wet, you can let that Roundup Ready corn go to two, three leaves. You know, if it's, again, if it's not if it's not taking moisture away, so it's to keep the slugs distracted. That's a tactic. Mess around with that, not in your whole farm. Um, I, I know of guys in France that are actually spinning on oil seed rape seeds. They grow pretty good if you have some soil that they can hit, and the slugs will way prefer that. They keep them distracted. So that's just some cool ideas that are coming down the pipe. Uh, that you can do. So I'm excited about this day and age. It's where technology meets our biology. You heard me talking about some highly technical things we have out there, but you know, when we talk about cover crops, no-till, and diversity, I just think we have a bright future ahead. I understand uh, there's challenges, uh, but there's, there's a lot that we can look forward to. So uh, thank you for my time here. I think I have a few minutes, don't I? I'd like to ask, ask some time for some questions. Okay, you, you cut them off and you feel so. Any questions? Okay. One of the things that we deal with up in the northern tier is moisture or fragile Yeah. And how in the world do you break those things? How do you, so how do you be broken up in forests? How do you break up glacial fragile pans? Well, the best way is if you fish. I'll just say the easiest, the ideal way is if you can have a small grain, take it off and plant deeper in the covers like radishes or ryegrass. <coughs> Maybe you, none of you can do that. I don't know. I'm just making that a suggestion. Uh, people ask, well, should I, I mean, I'll just ask you, uh, people ask me, well, should I just subsoil or rip the soil? And I'm like, well, if it's pretty bad, maybe tillage is a transition tool that you can go to that. Uh, if, you know, I, I, I don't know for sure. Um, I don't do it anymore. I, don't, I mean, I've had many people come to my farm with their penetrometers and, and they're looking at my soils and they can't find compaction. So uh, it works over time. So I don't know if, if, if I, I would say that, the, the, again, this is coming back to if you have a problem, you're going to have to back up and think, well, how can I address this problem? There's nothing better than roots breaking up compaction because they can work for you in wet fall. You don't want to go out in subsoil when the ground's saturated, you make it worse. And then not every year it's wet enough for the cover crops to grow. Some years it gets dry in September and October. Well, treat your cover crops like your cash crops. Do you not grow corn because you have a bad year? Okay. You're going to have a bad year of cover crops. Sometimes. Just saying. And you're going to have a banner year. That's why I say treat your cover crops like your cash crops. Think about it that way. You have to. I don't know, did I answer your question at all, or you want you want a more surefire answer? Yeah, there you did answer that. I didn't? No, because okay. even, even in forest, the roots will not penetrate. Yeah. Right? And then you've got diversity, and you've got other trees to grow. Okay. Anyone else have an answer? Oh, uh, surely the NRCS does. <laughs> I mean, you guys, you pay to think about this stuff. It might not work, I don't know. Um, yeah, we, we are cursed, I guess you could say, with that, you know, that fragile pan. Um, but you know, deep cover, uh, deep rooted cover crops will work. Um, you know, after a small grain is the best best way to do it. Well, thank you. More and more, um, I guess what I'm I'm seeing is by building that structure above that fragile pan, it's going to do more than than truly, you know, getting that fragile pan that's going to is there stored. More wonders than worrying about breaking up that that project at the bottom. Building that that structure above by having you know planting your you know, even the rice.
garage, you know, there's other cover crops, building that structure uh, is going to be more beneficial than, than trying that. Do you have a follow-up comment? Yeah. That's basically what Dave Brown told us when we posed the same question. He's like, okay, you're probably not going to be able to go down. You're going to have to go up. Well, I'll just, uh, and I'm not sure if this is relevant or not, but how many of you have been to uh, Illinois in the winter? Like Decatur's? Anybody? I mean, it's just black swall everywhere. And those guys were telling me five years ago, yep, we got a fragile fan. Nope, your cover crops won't be down good. They go down. I remember guys telling me, they go down and they go like this. Well, after a few farmers started doing it a few years, they broke through eventually. And now, you can talk to those guys, they broke through their fragile fragile fan. And maybe you do it once and maybe it doesn't because of whatever. I'm just saying, that's the best thing I have. I'm so happy to hear that Gabe Brown suggested that too. It makes me feel good. We have a saying in Northern Tier, you need a hole in that water, you have a wetland. Right? Well, okay. well, Missouri, Southern Missouri is pretty much rock. <coughs> yeah. And so I get 45 inches. I could buy a farm there for 1,800 an acre. There's a reason. You can't farm it. <laughs> but I got pasture, but I can manage my pastures accordingly because I know that these plants can break the rock down, I can manage accordingly. So you, some of us can't change what we have. Some have very heavy clays, some have very sands, some of us have majority rock. And this is what you can do. If you manage upstairs really well, you take care of the downstairs, they'll modify the environment. So what you gotta do is you gotta farm vertically. You know, so I've learned, I, I can afford to farm that. Can't afford a farm in Iowa was 15,000 an acre. One thing I guess opened my eyes up was it's been, um, you know, several years ago we had those little rainfall simulators and we've had them here and we should have probably brought them but we took a test in our, our Volusia soil, you know, every my fragment pan soil. We took a soil test, or uh, one just down the road on one of our uh, well-drained, sandy, loamy soil that is conventional till the, the Volusia heavy soil was a no-till field for several years and that no-till field outperformed infiltration than that, that sandy loam that had been conventionally tilled. That's because we had that structure, I think, brought a good point from that project being up. And I, just to me, it opened my eyes how much we can impact or change our soil and how they the structure. 